Okay, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Professor Ahmed Abbas and Professor Fabhis of Google for the invitation for the nice organization of the conference. Okay, so I slightly changed the title so you can compare the title with uh, that on the program. Uh, it's longer, but I think it's more precise. Okay, so here, let me first introduce the uh, notation. So if, so the script if, is a trivial holomorphic vector bundle uh, on a disk on a ta ta uh, times uh, a neighborhood of a complex manifold, okay? Uh, I will denote the corresponding shift of holomorphic functions also by the same uh, notation, so script f. So f is free, so I, I emphasize here, f is free. Uh, Lambda is a collection, it is an integrable collection, okay? Uh, it is holomorphic on the punctured disk cross X. And we say uh, Labla has a pole of Poincare rank M along the divisor zero cross X, okay, if it satisfies this condition, okay. So if you write down the, if you choose a basis for I, I write down the collection matrix, and then the collection matrix is of this form. So the collection matrix is of form Tm sum, okay, dxi, so xi is a coordinate chart for, the, for, the, for x, and here you have some holomorphic functions, so let me write omega i, and plus uh, omega uh, dt over t, okay. So omega and omega i are holomorphic. So let's consider uh, two special cases, the rank one case and the rank uh, zero case. So the rank zero case is often called the logarithmic pole. We say this collection has a logarithmic pole. And its collection matrix is of this form. So m is equal to zero. Um, because our collection is integrable, so you have dA plus, so the matrix A, the collection matrix A, has a property dA plus A yj A is equal to zero. So I write down uh, this equation, okay? So of course, all the coefficients of the, of the sum are zero. Let's take the restriction to the divisor, zero cross x, see what we can get. Okay, so we got this one, okay? So the second one, the second one is just the second, okay, this term is equal to zero, okay? But we restrict everything to zero cross x. If you look at the second equation, it is of the same form as dA plus AYJ is equal to zero. That means this, this matrix also defines a collection, an integrable collection, okay? So the second equation shows that the restriction of blah blah to zero cross x to this divisor, so I did all by smaller blah, it is also an integrable collection, okay? And the first e equation shows that the morphism defined by the matrix omega, but also restrict to zero to the divisor, is a horizontal section. This omega is called the residue of this collection, okay? So here is the first equation, this one. So this means the morphism defined by omega is a horizontal morphism with respect to the collection defined by this matrix. Okay. So I summarize everything like this. So small labla is a restriction of bigger labla to the divisor. A residue just, okay, so uh, I will denote by R infinity that, that is a residue. Okay. So this collection, La bla, uh, small la bla composed small la bla is equal to zero, that means it's integrable. And the, the last equation means the residue is horizontal, okay. Now let's consider the rank one case, so that is m is equal to one now. And uh, again, I can write down the, okay, I write the uh, collection matrix that way. And again, I write down the integral, uh, because the, the collection is integrable, so I write down the equation for, uh, for this condition for the, for the collection to be flat. And now again, restrict this, uh, this equation to the divisor zero cross x. Then what you get is, oh, it's different, of course, it should be different from the rank zero case. And that's what we get. What that means? Okay, the first equation means that the phi defined by this collection matrix, or by, not by collection matrix, by the matrix omega i zero x dxi. So that's a matrix, that's an endomorphism of vector bundles with differential form size coefficients. So uh, the first equation means phi yj phi is equal to zero. That means phi is a Higgs field. Okay. Now, also what is R0? So R0 is the morphism defined by omega, z, omega x, okay, restricted to zero. 
And the second equation above means that R0, the bracket of R0 and phi is equal to 0. OK, now let's put the rank 0 and the rank y case together to see what we can get. Let, I, let E be a trivial vector bundle on X. So that a trivial vector bundle on X. And then let a pi be the projection from P1 cross X to X. And let's pull back this E on X to P1 cross X. So that's a pi star E. And suppose we have an integrable collection, blah, blah, on this pulling back. And also let's assume this pulling back has a logarithmic pole along infinity divisor and has a pole of Poincaré rank 1 along the zero divisor. OK, so we combine these two cases together now. Of course, because I assume E is a trivial vector bundle, the pullback, of course, is also a trivial vector bundle on the family of projective line. OK, now let's take the restriction of this vector bundle on the infinity divisor, because I assume that infinity is logarithmic. So I have this collection, small labla. It's a restriction of the bigger labla to the infinity divisor. And also, uh, so this is a flat collection on E because the restriction of pi of the pulling back of E to infinity is E again. So on E, we have this collection, small labla, and also the residual morphism. The residual morphism is flat with respect to small labla. And also, let's restrict, let's take the restriction of this uh, uh, collection to zero divisor, because I assume that the zero divisor, uh, the collection has Poincaré rank one. Okay, so this restriction will give me a Higgs field phi and also give me an endomorphism R0. Okay, so now we get a tuple. Okay, so we have a complex manifold X, we have a trivial vector bundle E, and we have a collection. This is small, small labla. Okay, small labla is a collection on E. And also we have R0, okay, this is this one. R infinity is a residue at infinity. And phi is a Higgs field. Okay, this gives rise to the so-called Frobenius type structure. Okay, now let me give the formal definition of a Frobenius type structure. A Frobenius type structure is a tuple, okay, like above. And uh, X is a germ of complex manifold. E is a vector bundle, but uh, let me emphasize it's a free vector bundle. Free everywhere, not just locally free. And R0, R infinity, or endomorphism of E. And phi is a fixed field, a Higgs field. Labla, small labla, is, is an integral collection on E. OK. And from this data, I can construct a bigger labla. It's a vector, it's a, it is a collection. It is a, it is a collection on the on pi star E, okay, on the pulling back of E to the family of projective line. Okay, so the capital labla is given by this formula. So the first term is the pulling back of labla. The rest is just an endomorphism with differential formats, as, uh, okay, with differential form values, okay. okay. Um, so now our condition is that this capital labla must be integrable, okay. So note that this capital, this bigger labla it uh, has a logarithmic pole along infinity. It has a uh, pole of Poincaré rank one along zero divisor. Okay, so we get we put this rank zero case and rank one case together now, and it is holomorphic elsewhere. And also the, the condition for integrability it can be written. Okay, uh, okay, it's equivalent to the following three equal uh, six equalities. So this first one means small labla is integrable. And uh, the residue at infinity is horizontal. Phi is a Higgs field. And uh, the bracket of R0 and phi are equal to 0. And then the, the, uh, the rest of the two equations just, uh, you know, it's a relationship between the data at infinity and at 0. So the phi, la blah, blah, phi is equal to 0. And then the, the last one equation. OK. So that's the definition of Frobenius type structure. So it looks, uh, well, it looks very complicated, but let me point out that any meromorphic integrable collection, blah, blah, on the trivial vector bundle, pi star e, on the family of projective line, with an algorithmic pole at infinity, and a pole of Poincaré rank 1 along 0 divisor, and no other poles, holomorphic elsewhere, is above the, uh, is above the form. So it gives rise to a Frobenius type structure. So you can just define a Frobenius type structure as something on the trivial vector bundle on P1 cross X. Okay, it's an integrable collection 
uh, on a free on a trivial vector bundle on the family of projective line. And uh, you needed to require you need to, you require that the uh, the collection has a logarithmic pole at infinity and a pole of Poincaré rank one at zero. So that gives you probably more geometric, more conceptual definition for Frobenius type structure. Okay. Now of course now we are in, uh, uh, we want to con how to construct a Frobenius structure. So you need to, to start with something. Okay. So um, erase. So we are going to start with, okay, suppose we have a family of disk, okay, so it's a D, D means disk, disk across E. Suppose that we have a free vector bundle F on D cross X on the family of disk. Suppose we have a collection blah blah on F, so F is free vector bundle, so triple vector bundle, okay. And also let's assume it has a punk ray rank one. <laughs> Do you really need trivial only log p1 directions and not trivial and log axis? Well, uh, so I should say that at the beginning, when I define the Frobenius type structure, x is a germ of a complex manifold. Right, so you can just always shrink x, so I should point that out. And trivialization is not part of the data, yeah. Right, yes, okay, right, yes. Mm -hmm. So you can always shrink x so that it's a trivial everywhere, okay? So uh, rank one, okay, so uh, it's a Poincaré rank one, not means a shape of rank one, so let me read. Poincaré rank is equal to one. Okay, so now I have something on the disk. I want to extend it to a Frobenius type structure. That means I want to extend it to something on P1 cross X. So that, okay, so let's deload the extension by F tilde, blah, blah, tilde. Okay, so I want to extend it to, to something like this. So that is a restriction to d cross x is the given data. It's a restriction uh, and also uh, at infinity, it has a logarithmic pole. Okay, so if you can do this, and also you need to extend f to a trivial vector bundle also on p1 cross x. Okay, so that's our problem. So if we want to solve such kind of problem so that we can construct Frobenius type structure. Now let's first consider the special case where x is just a point. So that is, we work with D and P1. So that is a classical Birkhoff type problem. Now Birkhoff type problem is like follows. Let D be a disk. Uh, F blah blah is a trivial holomorphic vector bundle. Okay, F is a trivial holomorphic vector bundle on D on the disk. And the blah blah is a, a integrable collection. Uh, it is holomorphic on the punctured disk. Uh, but it has a it has a pole of Poincaré rank one along zero. Our problem is is the following: we want to find a pair f tilde la blah tilde, so that f tilde is a trivial vector bound on P one. La blah tilde is a whole integrable meromorphic collection with an algorithmic pole at infinity. It is holomorphic outside zero and infinity, and its restriction is a given data. So that is a classical Birkhoff problem. Okay. It's not always solvable. So to solve this problem, you need some conditions on the on the data that you start with. F blah blah. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, the problem when you have no parameter. So or maybe the parameter space is trivial. It's just a point. Okay. And of course, as I said, you know, to construct Frobenius type structure, you need to to work with families. Okay. So I stated this one as a theorem. Birkhoff problem for a family. Now the D be a disk, okay? X is the germ of complex manifold. Uh, F blah blah is a trivial holomorphic vector bundle on the disk cross X, uh, equipped with an integral meromorphic collection uh, of Poincaré rank one along the zero divisor, okay? Suppose we can solve the Birkhoff problem for F blah blah restricted to a fiber, okay, D cross zero. So that means if I can solve this problem just for P1, okay, okay, so that is, that is a classical Birkhoff problem. If you can solve the classical Birkhoff problem on one fiber, then you have a positive answer for the Birkhoff problem for the family. Then, so the, the, the result is, then there exists a unique one, a unique pair, F tilde, blah, blah, tilde. Okay, F tilde is a trivial holomorphic vector bundle on P1 cross X. So X, you have to shrink X, okay, as I said a moment ago. 
And the Laplace tilde is a monomorphic collection. It has an logarithmic pole at infinity, uh, holomorphic outside zero infinity. And it's a restriction, okay? It's a restriction to this fiber is the Birkhoff problem, is a solution of the Birkhoff problem, the classical one, okay? So you have, so basically, uh, and also, uh, it's a restriction to d cross x is the data that you start with. Okay, so that, let me uh, draw a picture for this one. So this is my x. This is a p1. And uh, this is a 0, and this is a infinity. Okay. And so now, on a disk around a zero, okay, around a disk of zero, you have the, a data that you start with. So this is f tilde, oh, f, blah, blah, blah. It is defined on d cross x. d means the, uh, the disk around a zero. Okay. And also, let's suppose, okay, so this is the point x zero. Suppose you can solve the Birkhoff problem Okay, for P1, uh, for the, along this fiber, okay, so you solve this problem, okay, so this is a D infinity, so you have a D infinity, so that's a disk around the infinity, so I will use that later. Suppose you can solve the Birkhoff problem along, along, uh, along a fiber, then our result is that like you can solve the problem, Birkhoff problem for this family, so that is you get a solution F tilde, la blah, blah tilde, it's a restriction, to the disk around zero is a, is a solution, is a, is a data you start with. Its restriction for the, uh, along this fiber is a solution, is a solution for, the, uh, for, the, for the classical Birkhoff problem, okay? Okay, so that's, uh, that gives you a positive answer. But moreover, one can prove the following. Your solution, okay, it's unique. Your solution, if you restrict it to disk times, uh, to the disk at infinity, Okay, it is equal to what? It is equal to the pulling back of your solution, okay? So it's a pulling back of your solution at, the special, at that special fiber. So that means what? That means your solution actually does not deform the data at infinity, does not deform your solution at, at, uh, at infinity. So here at infinity, and let me just write undeformed at infinity, okay? So that is, that is due to the, some kind of rigidity property of logarithmic post, uh, logarithmic collections. Okay. Also, we have an algebraic version of the Birkhoff problem. Uh, let G blah blah be a, a C tau tau inverse module equipped with a collection uh, with post at zero and infinity and with regular singularity at zero. So this is just an algebraic version of a vector bundle on P1 uh, minus zero and infinity. Okay. So uh, let's suppose G0 is a free C tau submodule of G with Pangre of rank one, Pangre rank one, uh, such that G0 tensor, this poly Laurent polynomial is equal to G. Uh, so that means G0, so let me also draw a picture, okay. Here, so basically you have uh, P1, that is P1, delete zero, delete infinity, on this, on this, delete zero and infinity, you get this uh, vector bundle G. It's a free vector bundle, it's a trivial vector bundle. And suppose at zero, you can extend G to G zero, okay? Around, so G zero is a free, it's, it's also free C tau sub module, so it's a free vector bundle, primary rank one, and it's a restriction to, the, to P1 minus zero infinity is this G, okay? Uh, then the Birkhoff problem is to find uh, uh, free uh, sub-module, so free module, C tau inverse module, G infinity, also with logarithmic power. So you want to extend G to G infinity, okay? So that G infinity is a free vector bundle uh, near uh, in a neighborhood of infinity. And also we want a G zero, uh, G infinity restricted to P1 minus zero infinity or equal to G. And also we want the vector bundle that you glue G zero on the you can glue G zero and G infinity along G. So you want the, 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 glue, the vector bundle defined on P1, this one is a trivial vector bundle. It's, a tree, it's free, 
Okay, so that's the algebraic version of the Birkhoff problem. Okay, so now we want to give a criteria for uh, for the answer for this algebraic version of Birkhoff problem to be uh, to be solvable. Okay. Okay, let V be the Delin extension of this uh, meromorphic collection G blah blah, because G blah blah has uh, an algorithmic collection, so you can define the so-called Delin uh, extension, the Delinitis. And uh, at infinity is just the fiber of this Delinitis at infinity. And uh, molodromy, so you have a molodromy around infinity X on it. Um, let's consider an increase in filtration on this at infinity. Okay, so how this uh, filtration, uh, how we get this filtration? So you say we start with something G0, okay? So G0 is the data you start with, okay? So it's something on zero, so it's a uh, Pangre of rank one, it has Pangre rank one. Um, okay, so we consider this one. G0 mod uh, divided by tau k is of course equal to tau G0 divided by tau k plus one. Because G0, you say G0 is a C tau module, so tau times G0 is contained in G0. So we get G0 mod tau k is contained in G0 mod tau k plus one. So tau minus k G0 give you an increase in filtration on G, okay? So that gives you an increase in filtration on G. Now this increase in filtration on G will induce a filtration on H infinity, okay? So, it's, so that G, GK H infinity is this increase in filtration defined from this lattice G0. Okay, now I can start state the uh, Marhiko Settles criteria. Let M be the real potent part of the molodromy T. Suppose there exists a mixed Hodge structure on the nearby cycle of G at infinity, so that the Hodge filtration is given by the, filtration, the increase in filtration that I just defined. And the weight filtration is a molodromy filtration, okay, of n. Then we can solve the Birkhoff problem, okay. So let's recall a fact, okay. So it's a theorem proved by Berlin, okay. So it's a, if you know f is a punctually pure least QL bar shift on p1 minus zero or maybe delete or some other points, then the molodromy filtration on F8 infinity, so F8 infinity you consider as a representation of the local Galois group uh, at infinity. So on this, on this uh, F8 infinity, basically F infinity is also the Wallenstein cycle, uh, my, uh, Lierberg cycle of F8 infinity. So on this uh, Galois representation, you have the weight filtration, and also you have also the molodromy filtration. Now Delin proves that the molodromy filtration is the same as the weight filtration probably up to a shift, okay. So this condition, so let's compare this condition, uh, this, this theorem with the condition of Marhigo Saito, okay. So his condition says that um, you want the, okay, so you have a mixed hostage structure, the weight filtration should be the molodromy filtration, okay. So at what time, so in the analytic case, when weight filtration is the same as molodromy filtration, well, if you start, if your local Galois representation comes from a global one, a, a representation of the global Galois representation, so that the global one is pure, then you have that condition. Okay, so for this reason, let me propose another uh, analytic version of the Birkhoff problem. Okay, so let A to zero be the generic point of the hensonization of, of the projective line um, over the finite field, and uh, it takes its strict localization at zero, and uh, let A to zero be the generic point of the strict localization. And suppose you have a row uh, representation of the lo local field. So it's something like you have something here, okay? Or maybe let me draw a picture here, it's P1. Oh yeah, I already have the picture here. So but here you have a representation, okay? Uh, let's find a condition, of course, so it's not always solvable. So let's, let's try to find some conditions on row. Under this condition, there exists a least punctually pure shift, QL bar shift F on P1 minus zero infinity. It should be a timely ramified at infinity, and its restriction to F0, uh, its restri restriction to eta zero is a given representation. Okay, why I call this one as Birkhoff problem? Because you see when uh, in the Marhigo Sato criteria, when he, saw, when he want to solve the Birkhoff problem, he just, uh, well, he put some conditions, like the weight filtration is a molodromy filtration. But we know the weight filtration is a molodromy filtration if you start with 
start with something pure. So in my version of the Birkhoff problem, you know, I just put the I want the solution to be pure. So you just try to extend your local representation to a pure representation. And of course, you want the representation to be permanently ramified at infinity, because that's also the solution for the Birkhoff problem. You also want the, uh, something to be time at infinity. But I put a quote on the Birkhoff problem because this AOID version does not capture all the conditions in the Satos criteria. In Satos criteria, you also need some conditions on the Hodge structure, Hodge filtration. Of course, it's impossible, you know, to you know to 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 have the AOID counterpart of the pure Hodge filtration. Okay, anyway. Okay, now let's uh, go to the construction of uh, of Sabah and Dua. Uh, they construct uh, some kind of uh, Frobenius type of structure starting from a long degenerate convalient Laurent polynomial. Okay, so let me first introduce some, uh, some notations. Wj are some vectors with integer components, and f is just a Laurent polynomial. Okay, so its exponent just comes from this Wj. And the delta is a Newton polyhedron of f at infinity. The definition of Newton polyhedron at infinity is the convex hull of those exponents w1 to wn and zero. Okay. And we suppose we our condition well, so we make the assumption that f is convenient and long degenerate. Convenient means what? Convenient means zero lies in the interior of delta. And uh, long degenerate means the following. If you, for any phase sigma, small sigma of delta, not containing the origin, okay, you consider the part f sigma. So that is, you take this, uh, those Laurent polynomials, uh, those terms in Laurent polynomials, but you only take those, those terms with exponent, whose exponents lies in this phase sigma. And then you, you want to say, okay, you solve this equation, the partial derivatives all equal to zero. If, this, uh, if there is no such critical point, then we say, for any sigma, then we say f is long degenerate, okay? And also let the g1, gm be another family, be a family of Laurent polynomials. So you have m uh, poly Laurent polynomials. And we can consider this deformation. This is a deformation of the Laurent polynomial f, okay? So you start with a small f, and then you deform these uh, Laurent polynomials by introducing those x, the parameter x1 and xn. Okay, we say f is a subdiagram deformation of f if all the exponents of this Laurent polynomial g1, gm lies in the interior of delta. So delta is, uh, is a convex hull of the exponent of the Laurent polynomial f. Okay, and you know that if f is a, if f is a subdiagram deformation, then you can also calculate, you can also calculate the, uh, the, 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 poly, the Newton polytope at infinity of this deformation, okay? Because we, uh, if G1, GM, if, if this is a subdiagram deformation, then you say because you assume G1, GM, their exponents less in the interior of delta. So this won't change the Newton polyhedral at infinity, okay? We say F is a universal unfolding if the images of G1, GM in the Jacobian quadrature form a basis. And uh, one can show that if uh, G1, GM form a basis, then this uh, deformation has some kind of universal property, but I don't want to state that. Uh, now it's a construction of Dua and Sabah. And we consider the twisted Durham complex, okay? So this Durham complex, so you see, um, Tn means uh, n-dimensional torus. AM is all fine, uh, AM is m-dimensional all fine space. AM, I mean also say, AM is a parameter space for this deformation. You see the, the coefficients, uh, the coordinates are x1 and xm. Okay. And you consider the relative, okay, so you consider the torus, the relative torus. Okay, the torus parameterized, parameterized by AM. And consider this uh, Durham complex. But now I do not consider the Euro Durham complex. I consider the Durham complex with D uh, twisted by e to power Tf. Okay. And, uh, then I can, and then you can show that the Durham cohomology actually is long trivial except for the n, nth cohomology. So, you, you can, so G is the nth cohomology of this one. Uh, what is a G0? G0 just means, okay, you, you take, a, uh, you just replace this capital F, the deformation by small f. So that is, you do not deform the f. You, can, you just consider the trivial deformation of f. You, get, you will get this G0. So you can, one can show that G is a free, 
uh, CX1, XM module, tau, tau inverse module, so that is geometrically it means it's a free vector bundle, it's a trivial vector bundle on P1 minus zero infinity uh, family, okay. You, you can also define some collections on it, on G and G0. Of course, G0 is actually a special case of G because G0 uh, it corresponds to the trivial deformation of the Laurent polynomial. And one can show that G blah blah has a regular singularity at T0. And also one can define your lattice, G0, okay? Uh, you just replace uh, that, that parameter T by one, or one over tau, so, and also you just move this T, but uh, originally it's a T times a DF. You move T to the front of D, you get one over T, okay? So this is the definition of G0. So G0 is basically almost the same as G, but you know, it, you want to make it become a lattice, so you, you change the parameter. And then you can show that G0 is a, is a trivial vector bundle on P1 minus zero, so that is my G0, okay? Okay, so this is, it is a lattice of G, so we, we get G also. So G is something on zero minus, uh, P1 minus zero infinity. And then blah, blah, define monomorphic collection on G0 with Pangray rank one, okay? Uh, G0 is uh, called the Briscoe lattice associated to this subdiagram deformation. So this is works for only for subdiagram deformation. Using Sato's criteria, Dwight and Sabah prove that the Birkhoff problem is solvable for this pair, G, G0. And of course, G, uh, this one, this one corresponds to the trivial deformation. That's also a special case of the subdiagram deformation. So, so you, of course, they also solve this one. Uh, for this pair, they also solve the Birkhoff pro uh, problem. And now, let's consider the universal unfolding. Now the problem becomes more complicated. There is no algebraic way to define uh, Briscoe lattice. So let me, well, I will skip this part. Uh, let me just mention that, uh, well, when you define GG0, like this, um, you, need, you have to rely on some transcendental procedure. Uh, roughly speaking, G is a free transform of the Gauss mining uh, system uh, for, the, for, the, for this universal deformation. And uh, G is a trivial holomorphic vector bundle on P1 cross uh, P1 minus zero minus infinity cross X. Now, now you have a parameter X. What is that X? X is a, of, is a, is a neighborhood of zero in the affine space AM. Because when I define the universal unfolding, you see, the universal unfolding has a parameter space. Its coordinate is S1 to XM. So it's parameter that's in AM. But now when you construct the bridge cone that is, uh, okay, so you can only define the over a small neighborhood of zero, okay. Okay, so that is my x. And uh, g, uh, okay, so you also have a collection of blah, it has a regular singularity at infinity. Uh, g zero is a lattice uh, of g, uh, Pangray rank is equal to one, okay. When restricted to the, per to the parameter x equal to zero, uh, this broke, this Briscoe lattice for the universal unfolding coincides with the one algebraically that I just defined for the trivial deformation, okay? Because Duan and Sabah verifies using subtle criteria, they prove that the Birkhoff problem uh, is solvable along this special point, that is for the trivial deformation. So now because by the theorem I stated a moment ago, you can solve the Birkhoff problem for the family, okay? <coughs> for this, uh, with us guys, a uh, get a Frobenius type structure on the universal unfolding. But to get a Frobenius manifold structure, you have to do more, okay? Uh, you need uh, to find us a primitive form, a uh, primitive form to transplant the Frobenius type structure to the tangent space of the universal unfolding parameter space, okay? We also need to put a metric because by definition, a Frobenius uh, manifold is something that you have a Frobenius type structure on the tangent space, okay? Also, you have more, you also need a metric, okay. <clears throat> Another approach is to start with the solution of the Birkhoff problem for subdiagram deformation. A moment ago, I also said that Duan and Sabah, they prove the, using Sato's criteria, they also prove the Birkhoff problem is solvable for family. For which family? For the family defined by subdiagram deformation. If the subdiagram satisfies certain generating conditions, then there is a theorem of Hardini and Mani. So uh, this, uh, this theorem shows that uh, the, the solution, okay, the, the Frobenius type structure on the subdiagram deformation has a universal, has a universal deformation. This universal deformation will give you uh, the Frobenius manifold structure, okay. 
Okay, in summary, we start with a bridge coordinate uh, for f. Okay, so this is a trivial deformation. And uh, we, uh, okay, what is a bridge coordinate? Bridge coordinate is obtained as a free transform of the Gauss money uh, system associated to this Laurent polynomial. This Laurent polynomial is a morphism from torus to A1. And then you solve the Birkhoff problem using Settle's criteria. Okay, so you get the solution of the Birkhoff problem along one fiber. Okay, this bridge coordinate is for this uh, trivial deformation has a uh, universal has a deformation, which is a bridge coordinate for the universal unfolding. So that is G zero. So G zero is a bridge coordinate uh, for the universal unfolding of of that F. Then you you extend the, Okay, so then you extend this. Uh, Birkhoff problem, uh, solution of the Birkhoff problem, okay, for this special fiber, and for this data you start with, then you get a solution for the family, okay? You get a solution of the Birkhoff problem for the Briscoe lattice of the universal unfolding. We thus get the uh, Frobenius type, type structure. Now, arithmetically, so I'm interested in the aortic or maybe characteristic P part, okay? So what I'm going to do, Okay, so originally you started with uh, Briscoe Nettis, so it's related to the free transform of the Gaussmann system. Okay, now Gaussmann system just correspond to RF Shrek QL bar, so that's Gaussmann system, and then you take its free transform. Okay, but then Duane Sabah proved that uh, the Birkhoff problem is solvable for this one. Okay, they use Settle's criteria. So of course, we should verify that this free transform of RF strike QL bar should satisfy the conditions of Settle's criteria. Now, for me, the aortic criteria just means, okay, it must be a purely shift on P1 minus 0 and infinity. Also, it should be time at infinity, or maybe at 0, depends on the coordinate that you choose. And also, hope, also you hope that uh, it has a Poincaré rank 1. Okay, so arithmetically, it means that uh, its slopes at a zero or at infinity uh, should be less than or equal to one. Okay, actually, we're going to prove some similar result for the free transform of RF strike capital F. Capital F is a subdiagram deformation. So basically, I'm going to do the same, the same thing for the subdiagram deformation. Okay, then we have to deform your solution. Okay, you get a solution for this one point. Uh, along one fiber, and then you need it to deform. And then after that, you need to study the after deformation, local deformation, and then you try to extend this one to a solution on the, on the whole space, okay? So then we study the deformation of this free transform with prescribed local monodromy at zero and infinity. Okay, so um, here are some notations. FQ is a finite field. Uh, Psi is a long trivial additive character. Uh, the way that I'm going to study uh, the free transform of RF Shrek QL bar is to, is to use hypergeometric functions, uh, hypergeometric shifts, or may, uh, you even call it GKZ hypergeometric shifts. Uh, an analog of the classical hypergeometric integral, okay, I read that one, okay, that's an exponential integral, is this, a diff, is this um, exponential sum. Actually, this exponential sum has been studied by Denneff and Noether, and also by Adolfson and Sperber. Uh, in their papers, they only consider, they consider the, the special case where those yj is constant, okay? But now the, it's the idea of Gaifond, or maybe philosophy of Gaifond, is that if you want to study, okay, maybe study just the special exponential sum, is not, you may not capture uh, its whole property. You should study family of them, unite the parameter, unite the, you just introduce some parameters and study some families, then you will get some more information, okay? So this one, so we just denied the coefficient yj to change, okay? Then you, then you get the hypergeometric functions or refinite field, okay? Now, how to define uh, what is a corresponding, okay, use, uh, if you have a family of exponential sums, then you should have a Galois representation or maybe an aortic shape. Okay, what is that aortic shape? An is n-dimensional fine space, Tn is n-dimensional torus, Okay, so I can define a morphism like this. So this morphism is defined by this Laurent polynomial. But this Laurent polynomial, the coefficient yj now is a parameter. Okay, it's indeterminate. Okay. And uh, okay, so we have these projections uh, to, P, to, to Tn and to An. Now the GKZ hypergeometric shift is defined to be this object. So you use edge, 
this morphism match actually is that the Laurent polynomial with variable coefficients. Use this morphism to pull back the artificial shift, and then push forward using pi two. Then you will get something on a n, right? Get something on a n. Now by Grossani trace formula, you can calculate the trace of Frobenius on this shift, and uh, this this trace is exactly that exponential sum, that family of exponential sum. Okay. Now we have the following theorem. One can show that hypergeometric, uh, that GKZ hypergeometric shift is a mixed perverse shift on the affine space a n. It's way uh, with weight less than or equals to n plus l, and its rank is minus. Uh, it's related to the volume of that polytope at infinity, Euler polytope at infinity. And also we can do more. We have uh, combined, We can write down the formula for the rank of the weight. W sub quotient. So that is, you uh, you can use the weight to define something like uh, something like a Poincaré uh, type, you know, uh, polynomial, and then you can you have a com combinatorial formula for the Poincaré polynomial defined by weight. Okay. Now another kind of, another result. Suppose V is a Zariski open subset of the affine space, so that this V parameterizes uh, so that the parameterizes those Laurent polynomials, which is non-degenerate. Okay, on moment I'll get it, I define what is the meaning of long degenerate polynomial, polynomial. Okay, then one can show that on this open subset of V, the hypergeometric shape is smooth, and it vanishes for i not equal to minus n. So you only have i equal to minus n to worry about. Now suppose zero less in the interior of blah blah, but actually this is my condition because I assume my Laurent polynomial is long, is convenient. Convenient just means zero less in the interior of the polytope, uh, of the Newton polytope at infinity. If zero less in the interior, then the hypergeometric shift is a smooth shift, pure of weight n, and also its rank is equal to n factorial times the volume of the uh, Newton polyhedron. Okay, so let's consider this a special Laurent, long degenerate Laurent polynomial, okay? And uh, let's suppose we have a subdiagram deformation. Uh, you can enlarge W1, Wn by adding those exponents of monomials okay, with non-zero coefficients of gi. In this way, okay, you won't change the, the polytope because the exponent of gi, they all lie in the interior of this delta. Okay? And also because of this, because now the exponent of gi also uh, belongs to W1, Wn, so you can write a gi as also the Laurent polynomial of this type. And uh, fxt, fxt is that subdiagram deformation. Okay, so you write down the formula for fxt. Uh, but I put a t prime here because later I needed to introduce another parameter. Okay. So this one, okay, is again a Laurent polynomial. And again, it's long degenerate and convenient. Okay, so x is equal to am, so that is my parameter space for the, for the subdiagram deformation. What is capital F? Capital F is, is the morphism defined by this, uh, by this uh, subdiagram deformation, okay? Because a, sub, a subdiagram deformation is just a family of Laurent polynomials, right? So this F family, this F just defines a family of morphism from torus to A1. And let's denote by phi this morphism. So I just map T1, X1, XM to that coefficient. So what is this coefficient? It's this one, okay? Okay, so remember that what I'm interested in, okay, uh, F is a, is a, is a subdiagram deformation, RF Schreck is the Gauss mining system, and I take the free transform of the Gauss mining system. So that is the analog of G, okay, that uh, I introduced before. Okay, so now we, uh, we have the following proposition. This free transform of the Gauss mining collection of the Gauss mining system is what? It's a pulling back by this phi of the hypergeometric shape. So that is, if you want to study the Gauss-Money, the free transform of the Gauss-Money system, you, can, you, only need to work, you only need to study the hypergeometric shape. Everything is determined by the hypergeometric shape. Okay. Moreover, we have the following. The image of, of a phi, okay, that capital phi, if you would delete zero on infinity, so capital phi is defined on a finite line, okay? If you delete zero from it, then its image is contained in the, op is contained in the open subset of V, parameterizing uh, long degenerate Laurent polynomials. A moment ago, I said that this hypergeometric shift has a nice property 
when you restrict to this open set V, uh, parameterizing non-degenerate neuron polynomials, right? Okay, so putting these two facts together, I get the following corollary. When restricted to P1, minus zero, minus infinity, then this uh, Gaussmannian system, free transform of the Gaussmannian system, vanishes for i not equal to n minus one. Okay, for h n minus one, it is a pure least shift of weight n. Also, I should say it's weight, or it's rank, I forgot to say, it's rank is n factorial times volume delta. And um, also it is, uh, it is pure, it is, okay, so it's a pure shift that is, you know, it satisfies the condition of uh, cytokine criteria. Um, and also we know that it is timely ramified at zero, it has slopes less than or equal to one at infinity, so that means you know, it's a uh, Pangre, that corresponds to the fact that the Pangre rank is less than, is equal to one, okay. Okay, so, so far everything is good, okay, it's uh, completely parallel to what happens in the, you know, in, in the work of Dua and Sabah. Now I'm going to, okay, I will skip this part, okay. Now I'm going to study the deformations, okay, because you see that when Sabah, uh, Dua, they construct the Frobenius type structure, they first solve the Birkhoff problem. For, for special fiber. And then they study, so then you have to the deformation, okay, the deformation. And then uh, that is a Briscoe lattice. And then you try to extend this one to, to something on P1 cross X, okay. So, so yeah, arithmetically, we start with this one, this special fiber, the one that I just solved using hypergeometric shift. And then that's, uh, okay, so later I will introduce some deformations at zero and also at infinity. And then now the problem becomes the deformation of aortic shifts. Okay, so I want to, uh, to be in a more general context. F is one of the following type of field. It may be a finite field FAL, a finite extension, or maybe a fi or maybe QL ball, or maybe there are finite extensions, or maybe there are algebraic coder. Okay, so the theory will work for all these types of field. C is a category of Artinian local F algebras with the rest of the field also be F. Uh, morphism uh, on C is just F algebra homomorphism. Uh, K is algebraically, algebraically closed field of characteristic P. Um, X is a smooth projective curve over K. Okay. S is a finite subset of X, but actually in my application, I only needed to take X to be P1. And S is just zero and infinity, but I want to be in a more general context. Uh, S is a generic point of a strict localization. It is the generic point of P1. And then for each I, we fix an embedding, uh, an embedding of the local Galois group to the global fundamental group. Uh, let's suppose I is a least shift, okay, on X minus I. So that is I is a shift on P1, okay, on this special fiber. Uh, row zero is a corresponding representation. Now my problem is deforming. How to deform this aortic shift? Or maybe how to deform this row zero? Okay, here is a theorem. Let R be a complete Lothrian local F algebra with residue field also being F. Let's suppose you have row S, okay, row S is some Galois representations of the local field. Okay, so let me draw a picture here. So I just draw a picture for P1. And I say just the zero and infinity, okay? Now suppose I have a row I, so that is uh, row I, so here is we have a row zero. That is a representation of the local Galois group, okay, to R. And also we have a row infinity is another represent, uh, Galois representation at infinity. Okay. So that is at zero and infinity, I already introduced some deformation, okay? But along this line, along this line, we start with the representation, it is representation corresponding to that shift row, okay? Corresponding to that shift row. Here, I did it by row zero, okay? R row zero is just a representation of the pi one, p one, minus zero infinity, okay, to uh, GL, now this is just a, I is just a residue field of R mod M, okay? So I have something on the fiber, and I have some deformations along zero and infinity. Now when you can solve this problem, okay? When you can extend this one to a global deformation, now the criteria is this. 
Suppose x equal to p1, so just like this. Suppose n morphism of f is equal to f. So this condition actually is not serious because usually we just start with a shift which is uh, irreducible, okay, absolutely irreducible. Then by sure lemma, n of f must be f, okay. And suppose there exists a representation lambda, it is of rank one, so that a row restricted to this local Galois group is equal to determinant row x. Uh, no, lo, lambda is also a uh, deformation of determinant row zero. Okay, so that means, suppose you can solve this problem, solve this pro you can extend all this data after taking determinant. Okay, suppose after taking determinant, you can extend this, uh, you can extend this data to something globally defined. Okay, so that's my condition. Then the result is that there exists a deformation row Okay, rho is a morph is a fundamental is a representation representation of the fundamental group, and uh, okay, locally it's just rho s, and also its determinant must be rho. So that is, if you want to solve this aortic Birkhoff problem for a family, basically all you need to do is to solve the problem for the rank one determinant. Okay. So let me give you some examples. Uh, I will take this example. Uh, Laurent polynomial is T1 plus Tn minus 1 and then plus their reciprocal of their product. Now why take this example? This example, okay, so it's proved by Baronikov that the Frobenius manifold structure on the universal unfolding of this morphism is isomorphic to the one attached to the quartum cohomology of P, Pn minus 1. And also arithmetically, it's also very interesting because uh, the free okay, the the Gaussian of the, of the free transform of the Gaussian system uh, attached to this f is closely related to the Kruskal sum. Kruskal sum is also a very uh, interesting example, you know, in arithmetic. Okay, and okay, so let's take uh, f to be the free transform of this Gaussian collection, and one can calculate its uh, local, you know, locally you can ca calculate its monodromy. So f restricted to eta infinity is equal to by that, by that's those Artin short shift, it's a direct sum of Artin short shift. And f restricted to eta zero is terminally ramified uh, with unipotent monodromy and single Jordan block. Okay. I will denote this one by u. So that is u is a representation of the local Galois group. It is terminally ramified. It is unipotent with a single monodromy. Okay. And I want to, okay, so now I want to study its deformation. Uh, first, I uh, just uh, introduced some deformations on infinity, at infinity. Okay, now this Galois group, uh, local Galois group at infinity has a time uh, prime AO part. Okay, prime AO part map, okay, maps surjectively to the O1 by this standard morphism. And uh, let's take a character of the ZL1 to, kill, uh, to this formal power series. Uh, you just map the generator to 1 plus SI. Okay, take the Take their composition, you will get a deformation. Okay, you will get a representation. Okay, this representation. So this representation, I will denote by chi i. This representation, uh, one can show is a universal deformation of the trivial character. Okay. Now by our theorem, that is, I just mentioned a moment ago. Okay, uh, there exists a representation. This representation, okay, it's, uh, it lands into the coefficient ring. It's now it's a QL, the formal power series with n variables. But now you need to model out an idea, okay. So that the row model out the maximal idea is the representation row zero. Uh, row restrict to infinity is that u. Now why was, why I wanted the restriction to eta zero to be u? That is because when I uh, mentioned the classical uh, Solution to a family solution. Uh, when I okay, when I stated the theorem of Duan and Sabah about the uh, construction of the Frobenius type structure at infinity is undeformed. Okay, at infinity is undeformed because it's uh, it, it is due to the rigidity of logarithmic uh, collection. Okay, so I just keep the infinity to be undeformed, but now because I change the code in the system, now it becomes rho restrict to eta zero is undeformed is u. But the row restrict to infinity, okay, so you have some kind of deformation. Okay. And then one can prove that such data, such local data can be extended globally. Okay. So this is an example. But what is uh, how to do how to prove such kind of result? Suppose we are given 
uh, row zero. So that is the uh, representation that we start with. For convenience, let's assume the determinant is equal to one. And uh, let's also uh, suppose we are given some uh, matrix, non-singular matrix, P zero i's for each i's. Okay. Now I'm going to define some uh, functors, deformation functors. For an A belongs to this Artin algebra, uh, this category of Artin algebras. R A is what? R A is just a deformation of row zero. Okay, so rho is a representation of the fundamental group of the projective line of, of x minus those x. Uh, its coefficient is in A. And if you model out the maximal idea of A, you get rho zero. And also I want the determinant rho to be one. And also P i is just some kind of coordinate chart at the local, at the local point. Okay. Um, okay, also I want to uh, R A is equal to the isomorphic classes of it. Okay, so there is a way to define when to such pair, when to when to such data or uh, equivalent. Okay, but you know, it essentially says that row one and row two are equivalent. Then you know you put you put this you consider the equivalent class. And also locally, we also have a functor R S A. R S A is this is just a representation of the local Galois group. Okay, I want it to be a deformation of row zero. Okay. Now one can show that R R and Rs, they satisfy the Schles Schlesinger's conditions, and they are pro-representable. And also we have canonical morphisms. So if you have a global deformation, then you restrict to the local one, then you get a local deformation. So you have a, a morphism from the global one to the local one. Now the fibers of this morphism are just the representations of the fundamental uh, groups with pre prescribed local monotomy. Actually, these functors also appear in Kissing's work. Okay. Now we have the following theorem. All these functors, let's suppose n of f is equal to capital is equal to f. That means you basically assume f is uh, absolutely irreducible. Okay. Uh, then these functors are smooth, Rs, these local functors are smooth. These morphism are functors, okay. So you you put you take a global deformation, restrict to each local Galois group. Okay, so you get such a functor to the product. This function is also smooth. So basically the universal deformation rings are just a power series. Okay. And also we have a formula for the tangent spaces. Okay. Now in the special case, when uh, f is given by that special Laurent polynomial, uh, well, we have such formulas for the, for the tangent spaces and also for the dimension of the fiber. Now in the transcendental case, we deform briscoe lattice associated to f by the briscoe lattice associated to the universal unfolding. That is your deformation spaces of dimension n, okay? Um, and also we keep the log logarithmic lattice at infinity and deformed. So that's what we did in the, uh, for the, when, we, when we construct the Frobenius type structure. Now this suggests what? This suggests that we should choose a subspace of R infinity, okay? It should be of dimension n, corresponding to the Briscoe lattice uh, of the universal unfolding, okay? And also at infinity, you just choose a trivial deformation, okay? Because at infinity, we do not deform the, the data. So you just map uh, every object A to U, so it's a constant deformation. And then we try to find the element in the fiber, okay, that corresponds to this Frobenius type structure. But I must confess that I haven't found uh, such candidates. That is, or at infinity, of course, you do not deform anything, okay? But at zero, what is, uh, the correspond what is the, the deformation corresponding to the universal uh, to corresponding to the Briscoe lattice of the of the universal deformation? Okay, so but also you can see that the theory uh, of deformations for aortic shapes is a bit different from the deformation theory for collections. Um, so probably I, you know when I work on this part of the problem, maybe I'm thinking, well, maybe probably I'm working on the wrong context. Maybe the more general context should be uh, instead of studying aortic shifts, you should study periodic theory. Okay, study the deformation of crystals. Okay, so that seems to be more uh, natural, you know, for this type of problems. Okay, but I haven't think seriously about that type of problem. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you. Any question? Okay, I just remarked the dimension don't match because you consider deformation of 
Right, yes. Mm -hmm. And also this you can really match scenes because you do feel, feel so different characteristic, yeah. Right, yes. Probably so maybe I should consider something dimensionless than then. But even for that, okay, if you do not deform the local monodromy, the fiber is also, you know, you can see the fiber is of dimension n times n minus one plus one. We should consider something, choose a subspace of dimension n from the fiber. That's also a problem which I don't know. Yeah. So, so in this in case, it's the PR, the formation of PR representations. Mm, yes, but your his study is the the uh, the, the, the Lambert field case. So you also some have some I O bar. Yes. Yeah, of course, the periodic part is very important in his work. Yeah, but you know, you see the definition almost the same. Okay, he, he just used a different terminology. He called it framely deformation. He fixed some basis locally. But what I did, he fixed another basis, but you know, some matrix. But they are basically the same thing. Yes. Is a question. Uh, in, the, in the Birkhoff problem, the classical, the, I mean, you have this notion of trivial bundle on P1. Right. And in the Eladic. Okay. No, I do not have the corresponding Eladic uh, counterpart for something for shift to be trivial, for vector bundle being trivial. So the condition I replace is just, you know, pure, this condition. But I really don't know some other conditions that correspond to this triviality of free shift. I don't know, actually. Uh. Because, I mean, they, they seem to be uh, different. Uh, for instance, if, if you take uh, the Fourier transform of a, a pure tamely ramified mm -hmm. Eladic sheaf on A1. Okay. I, is it a solution to your problem? I mean, do you know? Do you know it? Uh, well, so it depends. Some, if you get something pure. Yes. Okay. If it is pure, then of course you get it. But some, you don't know whether it is pure. Mm. Mm. Okay. No, because it, it seems that the, the right uh, the right analog in the complex case. I mean should not uh, take into account the triviality. I mean, if you, I mean, if you don't have the condition in the... Right, yes. You don't, do not need the condition in the, mm -hmm. in the complex case. So, I mean, it's just a, a little uh, simpler. Oh, you mean in the complex case, you really don't need the, the, the vector bundle not trivial? Yes, I mean, you don't, you don't, I mean, since you don't have the analog in the LAD case, you right. really need to to refer to it or to use it in the complex case. I mean, okay. It's, it's a little uh, it's, it's simpler than the true Birkhoff problem. Okay. Yes, okay, you mean my, okay, so this one is weaker in some sense, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think even for this one, you, you do not have a positive answer always, right? Mm -hmm. Because you see, at least the, 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 the Galois representation, you start with the local one, should, you know, it, it has monodromy filtration, it has weight filtration, they should coincide. So that's all, all right, one condition, uh, one restriction. But I don't know whether that's, that restriction is, uh, is, is, is a sufficient condition, actually. Well, question? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the Galois 